so much, uh, Dr. Stamps, for that very uh, kind and, and gracious introduction. And I am pleased to learn that I think like you. <laughs> this I is, think like you. This, this, is, uh, this is wonderful, wonderful. I'm glad we are in accord. A few things before we begin. Uh, Christianity uh, is a social religion. And to turn it into a solitary one is to destroy it. Uh, and so we will proceed liturgically. Um, you are a part of my story, and I'm a part of yours, because we are all a part of the body of Christ. Uh, and so at various points throughout my witness to the truth that is Jesus Christ, I will say, Lord, have mercy. To which you respond, Christ, have mercy. So let's try that. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. You are a quick study. <laughs> Names have been changed to protect the innocent. It's that kind of testimony. <laughs> it is a frank and honest account. I don't soft pedal it. I let the facts of my life, my story, speak for themselves. Those who know me well understand that I am, I am of a generous Catholic spirit in the best sense, as Wesley understood this trait in his sermon by the same name. I acknowledge the real Christians, my brothers and sisters, that are a part of the Roman Catholic Church today. Always keep that in mind in the moments ahead. But I also acknowledge that it was no one less than the Holy Spirit who called me into the life of the Wesleyan communion of faith for which I am and will be eternally grateful. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord. Amen. Amen. Generally speaking, Irish Catholics tend to be serious and disciplined, and this trait was in ample supply in my father, who continually stressed the importance of education in general and getting good grades in particular. A graduate of St. John's University with a degree in business administration, my father nevertheless could not resist the strong forces of the Irish-American subculture of which we were all a part. And so he, too, joined the New York City Police Department. <laughs> Some of my earliest memories of my father is seeing him pointing a Smith and Wesson special, a 38 revolver, at a large mirror in the kitchen and firing, unloaded of course, uh, seeing if his hands shook at all. My formal education began at a local parish school in Brooklyn. I first encountered the Sisters of Mercy in kindergarten, where discipline, raised voices, and staccato verbal inflections created an atmosphere, an undercurrent, marked by fear. As a five-year-old, I recall looking at Sister Mary Rachel, her entire body covered in a habit of black and white, an enveloping garment that left only a small opening for her often flushed face that shouted out repeatedly what must be done. By the time I entered the fourth grade, physical violence was a very real possibility on any given day in my all-boys grammar school. For example, one afternoon, we were all paddled on our buttocks on the way to music class, having to bend over in the doorway as we left, simply because no one had known the correct answer to a question from the previous geography class. But this time, it was the Holy Cross brothers who were doing the beating. And unlike the nuns, they stepped things up a notch with sticks, paddles, and fiberglass rulers. 
It actually took little to set these religious leaders off, and one student in my older brother's class was picked up while he was in his seat, and he was thrown into the blackboard by an obviously mentally unstable brother. Two instances of physical abuse and the psychological trauma left in their wake stand out in my mind. The first, oddly enough, concerned my attempt to prove that I had actually done my homework. Here's the situation. We were given an assignment to learn the English prepositions, and more important, we had to learn them in alphabetical order. On Monday morning, Brother Xavier began with the student in the first row, first seat, uh, and each subsequent student was supposed to say the next preposition in order. Well, by the time it was my turn, I was somewhat flustered, and so I uttered the wrong preposition. Oh my, sin of sins, I was out of sequence. Uh, my punishment for this grievous offense the brothers had a way of making even the smallest things grievous, would consist in receiving three full throttle whacks with a fiberglass ruler across each of my open and outstretched hands. But if I was out of sequence, I was also out of patience and was determined not to be beaten yet again. I was an A student and worked very hard, very hard, and so I blurted out, I did indeed know the prepositions, all of them. Brother Xavier simply replied, always making a game out of everything, double or nothing, Collins, but you must recite all the prepositions in alphabetical order. Believing I could easily do this, I took the offer. But then the brother added one word, one very troubling word, just as I was about to recite the list. He said, backwards. Excuse me, I said. You heard me, Collins, the brother replied. Recite the list backwards. I was dumbfounded, perplexed, defeated yet again, and I therefore received my double measure of six strokes across each hand. My fingers hurt so much and swelled up so badly that it was only with great difficulty that I could even hold things for the next two days. Lord, have mercy. The second event involved the severe, even brutal beating of a student, Philip, whom the teacher claimed had hit him with a snowball on the side of the face on a certain Friday afternoon. Come Monday morning, Phil, like a lamb being led to the slaughter, was marched into my class of 75 students. Brother Andrew first slapped Phil repeatedly across the face with all his might. Then he whacked him on his hands with a ruler. And to top it off, to show that he was not one to be fooled with, Brother Andrew abruptly bent Phil across the desk and paddled his buttocks to the near exhaustion of his abuser. All the while, I could sense the entire class was rooting for Phil. Don't cry, I kept saying to myself. Don't cry. Stand up to this bully who wears a collar. And on that Monday morning, in the midst of all this violence, intimidation, and threats that were draped in a religious patina, something wonderful happened. A shaft of light broke through. Phil, though he had been badly pummeled, never shed a tear. He spoke not a word. Our class remained deadly silent, stunned by the brutality and silenced by the fear. And yet, you could sense the signs of relief among the students, and even an odd sort of joy as Phil left the room that Monday morning with his head held high. In my world back then, Phil was a hero. Phil had triumphed. He had taken all that they could throw at him, and he walked out with his dignity. The violent frenzy had been brought to a calm. Lord have mercy. Upon entering Catholic High School in Brooklyn, I hoped that the beatings would end, since some of my classmates were now larger and bulkier than many of the Zaverian brothers who ran the school. In this, at least, I was correct. 
Though the physical abuse was gone, psychological and emotional abuse quickly took its place in this post-Vatican II world. A watershed event for me took place in my junior year. We had just received our school rings, and we were all naturally very excited. I recall sitting in an American history class, and we had a substitute that day, Brother Foley. This was the same brother who used to open the window on the fourth floor of the high school, look out into the park across the street, and pretend he was shooting a rifle and picking off people. Noticing that we were all fidgeting and playing with our newly acquired class rings, Brother Foley decided that he would teach us all a lesson, and one we would never forget. And he was right. I never will forget it. Fiore, he shouted, which was the name of his soon-to-be victim. Uh, yes, Brother Foley? Uh, what's that you're looking at, boy? My school ring came, the sheepish reply. Come on up here. Brother Foley wheezed as a smile burst across his portly face. Let's see that ring. Come on, take it off. As I was sitting in the last row near the windows, I had a good idea of what was to happen, uh, and it was beginning to turn my stomach. You see, Fiore was somewhat effeminate, though I never knew him to be gay. Uh, but at any rate, he was often the butt of somebody else's jokes. Teenage boys can be so cruel. Now, Brother Foley had this whole male macho thing going on with pretended rifle shots and whatnot, and I feared for what would happen next. Taking the ring from Fiore, Brother Foley slowly walked to the window, opened it up, and held the ring outside as if to drop it, waited for the gasping responses of the students, and then let it go amidst peals of laughter as it fell four floors into the grating below. But I and a couple of other students were not laughing. As a matter of fact, I date this incident as the time I finally decided to leave the Roman Catholic Church. My thought at the time was simply this, I need to get away from these people. During my senior year in high school, my father insisted that I take the scholarship exam for St. John's University, his alma mater. These, however, were some of the last words I had ever wanted to hear. Me? At a Catholic university? Are you serious? Weren't 12 years of this sort of thing enough? I felt anger erupting in my heart, though outside I remained calm. I just replied no to my dad without ever indicating the reason why. But my father persisted in his request. He kept coming at me. And so in order to get him off my back, so to speak, I finally agreed to sit for the test. But in order not to undermine my game plan for college, I simply recorded the letter A for each and every question on the exam. <laughs> Didn't want to take any chances here. In the fall, I attended the school of my choice, the State University of New York at Buffalo, a large public radical school that prior to my matriculation had its ROTC building burnt to the ground along with admissions and records. I was as far away from a Catholic world as I could imagine, and I was delighted, invigorated with a sense of freedom. Because I had so intimately identified Christianity with my experience of Roman Catholicism, and I realized that others will have different experiences, I know that. I thought that I was basically done with the church. Bye-bye. Though I still had a fondness somewhere in my heart for Jesus. Nevertheless, I began to move in the direction of Eastern religions. At the university, for example, I enrolled in a Buddhist philosophy course, read the primary sources of this religion, and was remarkably impressed with Wapola Rahula's little book, What the Buddha Taught. 
This work made sense out of my very confusing world, and it gave me a feeling of peace that all would be well, though such peace would not last. By the time I was a junior in college, I decided to take a course taught by a Lutheran minister entitled Workshop in the New Testament that was offered in one of the experimental colleges at the University of Buffalo. Growing up as a Roman Catholic, I had never read the New Testament. In fact, at this point in my life, I actually knew the Buddhist scriptures, the Tripitaka, far better than I knew the Bible. Reverend Cobain's New Testament course was fresh, exciting, and engaging. The man brought a sense of the spirit of Christ to everything he did. I soon began to think that although Roman Catholicism was no longer an option, perhaps Protestant Christianity could be. Not surprisingly, I and my girlfriend at the time, who subsequently became my wife, began to attend Lutheran services. With continued study and prayer, uh, I sensed a call to the ministry, and so I submitted an application to a Lutheran, yes, Lutheran, seminary. <laughs> Hammer School of Theology in Ohio, a school that, by the way, no longer exists. It became a part of another Lutheran institution. As it turned out, Hama lost my application. Do you see the larger providence of God here? <laughs> In the interim, after graduation from UB, I went back to Brooklyn to my parents' house and encountered a retired Free Methodist minister, Reverend Arthur Albrecht. That is his real name, and he is so very precious to me and he lived a block away from my parents' house. And he introduced me to John Wesley's 52 standard sermons. So, at the ripe old age of 22, I read these sermons from cover to cover, and I was simply amazed. In these pages, Wesley described a life of liberty, grace, and love, a life that I had not known but was willing, indeed eager, to embrace. Lord have mercy. Right. Several months later, of continually being in the means of grace, that's so very important, I recall waking up one morning at my parents' house in Brooklyn, and I simply and wonderfully believed in Jesus Christ. I believed who Jesus said he was, a savior, a real savior, the kind who could set the captives free, and that the Most High was a God of grace and mercy and love. I believe that not only were God's promises for real, but that they were specifically for me, that not only had Christ died for my sins, even mine, but he had saved me from the law of sin and death. I was a new person, and I was surprised by all of this. My heart was filled with joy, and it was flush with the graces of redemption. The cycle of sinning, repenting, only to commit the same sin yet again was broken. The shackles of sin that once held me tight were gone. My heart was free, and I knew it. I marveled then at the sheer power and efficacy of God's grace. I still do. Lord, have mercy. Christ have mercy. Not long after my conversion to what Wesley himself called real Christianity, or the proper Christian faith, I and Reverend Albrecht attended a messianic evangelical group that worked among the Jews in Brooklyn. The service, which was held in a large room in a house in Brooklyn, was informal, and it allowed for participation of the congregation. On that Sunday morning, as I recall, it was testimony time. Uh, and the minister invited anyone uh, who so desired to give witness to what the Lord had done in their lives. Even though it was months since my conversion to the proper Christian faith, I was still in the graces of redemption in a fresh, even childlike sort of way. And so I rose to my feet. I thank God for the gift of his son, Jesus Christ, who is the bread of life, and I bore witness to the truth that through faith in Christ, 
I was not only delivered from the guilt of sin, but also from its power and dominion. I said all of this in a humble, thankful, and gracious way. Then, as I was simply reciting scripture, in this case from the first letter of John, the pastor shot to his feet and exploded. Stop. Stop this right now. How dare you give such a testimony, such a disturbance? Why, there are people here who have come all the way from New Jersey. How dare you do this sort of thing? Well, although I didn't think of it at the time, I probably should have replied in this way. <laughs> you know what's coming. You tell me these people have come all the way from New Jersey? Well, I tell you that Jesus Christ came down from heaven so that you could hear these very words of redemption, the gracious words of salvation. I looked at Reverend Albrecht, who was sitting right next to me, and his eyes were comforting, as if to say, all is well. <laughs> I sat down and felt no embarrassment at all, not the least discomfort. So assured was I of God's love in this particular moment, this time of very special witness. Lord, have mercy. After the service, the congregation assembled in the dining room for lunch. While we were all eating, I looked up and addressed the minister and said, I love your hymnology. I love the gospel truths that we were singing this morning in the carefully chosen hymns. What's that verse again, I asked? Though by sin oppressed, go to him for rest. Our God is able to deliver thee? That's a wonderful verse, I exclaimed. The young woman sitting next to me got the point immediately, fumbled abruptly, and nearly dropped her soup spoon. In a flash, she had seen what I had already known, that is, the disparity between what this church was singing and what it was actually teaching and preaching. The reigning theology at this little messianic group was some sort of folk evangelicalism. To be sure, there is a very popular model of evangelical Christianity out there in America, and it runs something like this. We sin, we repent, we ask God for forgiveness, and we commit the same sin again. We sin, we repent, we ask God for forgiveness, and we commit the same sin again. It is this cycle that is proclaimed as the quote, quote, normal Christian life because, after all, everybody knows we're only human and we sin in thought, word, and deed every day, right? However, if you hold these popular, though erroneous, views, John Wesley's theology is going to be like a splash of cold water in the face. Yes. And maybe, just maybe, you'll be tempted to cast those sermons aside. Do so, and you will still, however, have to face the clear teaching of Scripture in general and the first letter of John in particular. It is wise beyond measure to view the standards of redemption in yet another way as the promises that God will fulfill in our lives. Lord have, mercy. Christ Christ have mercy. The problem in Wesley's own age, as in our own, is that intricate theologies had been developed that put forth notions of redemption that essentially left people in their sins rather than proclaim a gospel that entailed real, genuine deliverance. For one thing, it would be a cruel mockery on the part of God if the Most High simply forgave our sins without also transforming our nature. Without such a change in nature, we would almost immediately commit those very sins for which we had just asked forgiveness in the first place. And what would be habituated over time in this troubled understanding of the faith would not be increasing levels of holiness, 
But the cycle of sin and repentance, hardly a prescription for serious Christian discipleship. This is the condition of Romans 7, and Wesley understood this as a pre-Christian state, uh, as one who is under the law and not as the normal Christian life, as it is often presented today. The internal division and contradiction that we see in terms of Wesley's own life prior to Aldersgate gives evidence of this. In his own language, he fell and rose only to fall again. Wesley had little peace and his conscience was overcome with the dogs of guilt, especially when he was in Savannah. This was hardly good news, and Wesley had the honesty and the courage to admit this. He had a measure of grace, to be sure, as he was under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, but he had not that freedom from painful, enslaving guilt or from sin's power. Some friends tried to comfort Wesley with the bromides of nominal Christianity, but in the end, what were such friends doing but simply polishing his chains? Lord have mercy. The gospel is good news indeed. And Wesley came to understand this more deeply as he became increasingly open to the grace of God. The gospel is the greatest story that has been or could ever be told. It is about Emmanuel, God come to us. It's about love and mercy and forgiveness and freedom, real freedom, not the phony kind of freedom that the world talks about that leaves a person twice a slave of self after the reform than before, but real freedom. Jesus Christ has the goods. He is a living Savior. He has the power to set the captives free. The God who is magnificent enough to have created the starry heavens in their glory is powerful enough to redeem those who suffer under the grievous burdens of sin of which they are ashamed. Again, the God who is merciful enough to forgive us our sins is good enough to transform our nature. Matthew put it well. You will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. I revel in the freedom that has been granted to me by no one less than the Holy Spirit, and I may be forgiven for celebrating the Wesleyan tradition a bit too enthusiastically. For I know from whence I've come and whither I am going. I realize after decades of careful study of the history of the church that the Wesleyan tradition, hear me now, is one of the most balanced, gracious, and empowering Christian traditions that has ever mediated the graces of Jesus Christ to a needy world. Did you hear that claim? Are you surprised? Well, it's true. And I say this with not the least sense of triumphalism or ethnocentric pride, but out of honesty, accuracy, and forthrightness. Wesleyanism is remarkably balanced, and it is marked by a number of conjunctions. It is both Catholic and Protestant. It celebrates faith alone and holy living. It glories in justification and sanctification. It champions free grace and cooperant grace. It is both personal and social. This tradition, so used by God, has been at its best a healing balm to the nations. It has mediated not only the love and mercy of God in the forgiveness of sins, but also the strength and vigor of the Most High in the new birth and onward to entire sanctification. Accordingly, when our generation stands before the throne of Christ, will we be able to say that we were good stewards of this precious Wesleyan tradition that has been bequeathed to us? Have we been as energetic and devoted as those 
who have gone before us? Have we been as appreciative of the legacy, rich and broad, that has been bestowed upon us? Clearly, there are some in the church today who have grown up in the broader Wesleyan tradition who are not as appreciative of what gifts are right before their eyes. Instead, they are simply tired of it all. They are incredibly bored with Wesleyanism. Forsaking the sacred call of proper stewardship, they want to move us on to other projects, other agendas, whether from the left or the right. The Wesleyan theological tradition is dead, they tell us which is more of a wish on their part than an actual fact. On the contrary, Wesleyanism in the global south is not languishing but flourishing, not dying but thriving. Again, John Wesley, these critics claim, let loose a tradition that from the beginning was unstable. And to top it off, these newfangled, self-appointed prophets proclaim that Methodism as a determinant experiment is over and gone. But don't you believe it. Don't you believe it. Not for a moment. The truth be told, Wesleyanism was, is, and remains a precious and chosen instrument used by the Holy Spirit to mediate the graces of our Lord Jesus Christ in order to set the captives free, in order to raise up a people marked by nothing, nothing less than holy love to the glory of God the Father. And so I must conclude my testimony, my witness to the grace of the Father manifested in the gift of the Son by the power of the Holy Spirit with words drawn from my own major theology on John Wesley, a theology of holy love from first to last. For those who are suffering, who bear the burdens of wrenching sin, whether personal or social, who have felt the anguish and the near despair of a divided will, where the mind assents to what goodness it knows, but the heart simply does not follow. For those who seek the freedom of the love of God and neighbor, but know only the slavery of self-will on a personal level and the bondage of an intolerant tribalism on a group level. For those who hanker after the good community where fellowship is a gracious reality and where consumerism and competition do not divide. For those who are tired, old, and lonely, who have been forsaken by an indifferent, materialistic society that considers them nothing. For those who yearn for a gracious word of liberty, real liberty, for all these people, these hurting people, the practical theology of John Wesley was good news indeed. It proclaimed nothing less than liberty to the captives as well as the acceptable year of the Lord. It offered succor where there was neglect, hope where there was despair, love where there was none. Pastorally sensitive, without diminishing the high calling of the gospel, John Wesley developed a ministry that was marked by a sophisticated balance, a balance that evidenced abiding holy love, the very emblem of historic Methodism, a tradition that remains so very vital and is needed now more than ever in order to serve Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit and to the glory of God the Father. Lord, have mercy. Christ, 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 Christ. Amen.